Hey everyone, Brian Zane here with another classic pay-per-view review as nominated by my Patreon backers. And this week, I'm looking at Beach Blast. Nominated on Patreon by Ricky Temple, and I hope I'm saying this right, Jordan Shabo, it's WCW's Beach Blast 1992 from the Mobile Civic Center in Mobile, Alabama, that classic vacation beach town, on June 20th, 1992. In terms of creative and in-ring production and the talent they had that time, really hard to hold a candle to 1992 WCW. That was one of their better years in terms of just that kind of aspect of the company. Uh, there were some interesting choices made in terms of the presentation of the show, which I'll get to in a second, but 92 in terms of in-ring stuff, really hard to top. This is widely regarded as one of WCW's best pay-per-views of all time, and this is my first time watching it, so I'm going to give it a go and see if I can believe the hype. I am, however, a little disappointed that uh, the show that I'm watching here wasn't the same beach blast as the one with Davy Boy Smith and Sting going against the Masters of the Powerbomb. Who can forget the exploding boat and cheat him the one-eyed mid Plant the bomb there. Oh, great stuff. Timeless classic. Anyway, so what's going on in WCW around this time? Well, there's a new sheriff in town by the name of Cowboy Bill Watts, and there's going to be some changes around here with him as the new head booker, and obviously the most important thing they have to address to really nip in the bud, no more flippy shit, kids. That's right, a dramatic changing of the rules to head back, to harken back to the good old days, I guess. No more throwing opponents over the top rope. That's an automatic DQ. No more jumping off the top rope. Also, an automatic disqualification, and also the uh, floor surrounding the ring, no pads, no mats, just straight up solid concrete. Sounds like a lot of fun. It sounds very safe. Uh, you know, this is, of course, part of Bill Watts' initiative to make things look tough and real. This is the first show that really implements these new rules, and it's one of the more questionable things, like I said, that Bill Watts did in his time in the company. In fact, later on in this show, you can hear Jim Ross on commentary really kind of towing the company line about these new changes, saying, sports rides you know, they just don't understand. I'm like, yeah, you're right. They don't understand. The fans didn't understand either, which is why this is kind of a much more maligned part of Bill Watts' regime in WCW. And I'll get into a little bit more in the very next match, in fact, as to why these rule changes were kind of problematic. 5,000 people in attendance in Mobile, Alabama. 70,000 pay-per-view buys. You got uh, the show beginning with Eric Bischoff and Tony Schiavone introing the show. They have a little chat with Bill Watts, and then they toss over to the announce team for the show, Jim Ross, as I mentioned earlier, and Jesse the Body Ventura, uh, the current mayor of Brooklyn Park, Minnesota at the time of this show. Uh, Jesse gets a special intro at the top of the stage where he's being pampered by some ladies in bikinis before he makes his way down uh, to ringside for this show. First match of the night is for the WCW Light Heavyweight Championship as Brian Pillman, the champion, defends against Scotty Flamingo, and wow, Raven used to look a lot different back in the early 90s. It's a relatively new championship for WCW. The Light Heavyweight title uh, became official in October of the previous year. Pillman was the first champion. He traded back and forth with Jushin Liger, and so now Pillman's a two-time champion at the time of this show. I just can't get over the, the patterns in this ring right now, because you've got Pillman with his Bengals-inspired trunks uh, as he wrestles, and you got the Flamingo who's wearing a very 90s themed design going on with his shorts here. Uh, it's a very well executed straight up wrestling match to open things up. Lots of fundamentals on display here. Uh, Flamingo gets the cutoff uh, in the match when Pillman goes to the top rope. The referee reprimands him because hey it's illegal now and then so Flamingo cuts him off and then dumps him off the top which is not the same as someone jumping off the top or throwing them over the top rope I guess. This is, a, this is probably the biggest problem, the biggest um, issue that comes up with these new Bill Watts implemented rules rules about no top rope stuff. Why would you do that? Why would you stymie one of your divisions and several of your wrestlers in this company, like Brian Pillman, by saying no more top rope stuff, no more fighting and flying to the outside, uh, that you just totally, you know, in theory, you heavily kneecap your uh, lighter, your smaller guys when you do that. That being said, though, I think the two guys in the ring, Flamingo and Pillman, did well, despite their limitations here. And just, again, wrestling a straight up match, it looked really good and really clean for the most part. Pillman gets a sleeper on Flamingo, but Scotty counters it by running Brian's head into the corner. Pillman's knee starts to buckle. He can't even get up. Scotty gets cocky and poses in the corner, but I think it's supposed to be a ruse here because Pillman gets right back up and get a back suplex from the second rope. A rope break in the pinfall. Scotty gets dumped over the top and onto the ramp. Pillman, uh, he gets a full head of steam. He wants to run out and do a diving attack onto Flamingo, but Scotty ducks. Uh, Pillman eats it face first onto the ramp. He crawls back in on the ring, but then Flamingo hits him with a knee drop and uh, pins him to be 
become the new champion. I'm going to give this one three stars out of four. Like I said, despite the limitations of the rules, no top rope stuff, no flying on the outside, uh, despite those happening, despite those rules in place, these two guys are able to execute a very solid, highly entertaining matchup. And you can really easily, from the very beginning, pinpoint who's the babyface, who's the heel. You can see it all in the ring and in their mannerisms and their entrance and stuff. Really well executed matchup here. Unfortunately, the light heavyweight championship was not long for this company. It would be retired by the end of the year. Uh, Brad Armstrong was officially the last champion in this division. He was injured in September, and they announced there was going to be a new tournament to crown a new champion, but it never happened. We then get the first part of what will be an ongoing recurring segment on this show, the bikini contest, what's officially labeled as, between Medusa and Missy Hyatt, who is the first lady of WCW. The MC for this event is a very flamboyant Johnny B. Bad, who has a lot of different outfit changes throughout the course of this night as the MC. It's like he's hosting the Oscars. He's got a whole bunch of different outfits for this thing. The contest is in three installments. The first of which we see in this evening is the evening gown one between the two of them. Then you get the bathing suit round. Round, then the itsy bitsy teeny weeny dot 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 bikini round. Ooh, intrigue. I am. Oh, it's so, so, so much titillation. I can't handle it. Uh, it's funny the order they have the women come out because you have Missy Hyatt come out first, then you have Medusa come out second, who's the heel here, and she just kills the crowd dead because unlike Missy, who's happy to be there and plays the fans, Medusa, part of the Dangerous Alliance at the time, is a heel, and she clearly has the body language of someone who does not want to be there and be involved in this objectification of women. And this whole thing kind of kills the crowd, especially the fact that the fact the heel comes out second. I think if you switch the order, which they would do in the future installments on this night, then I think you would have the crowd kind of end on a more positive note, because Missy Hyatt was the baby face. But we are not done here. Our next match pits the Taylor Made Man, aka Terry Taylor, aka the Red Rooster, taking on Ron Simmons, formerly of the tag team Doom, now going out on his own as a singles competitor here. My first thought when I saw Terry Taylor in the ring with his long ponytail was it, the, the hairstyle, at least bore a very striking resemblance to Dolph Ziggler uh, many years later. Obviously, in terms of their physical appearance and their style in the ring, two completely different things. You can't compare these two. But just from the hair alone, I thought that's kind of a Dolph Ziggler look right there. Bill Alfonso is the referee for this match. And, you know, when I first started watching wrestling, my first exposure to Bill Alfonso was when he was, you know, Taz and Sabu's cheerleader in ECW. And from that point on, I could just never take seriously Bill Alfonso as a referee from any previous archival footage. I've watched a lot of shows doing this segment where I see Bill Alfonso as a referee across like, all the different companies. I just can never take him seriously as an official, just knowing how he would evolve in later years, working with Sabu and Taz and everything, and it's just an RVD, of course. And yeah, I just can't buy him as a, as a, as a competent, you know, level-headed official. Simmons overpowers Taylor early on with a chop block, some big old slams, a press slam into the ring from the ramp. Again, tossing a guy over the top rope as long as the ramp is involved on either end of it, I guess is okay and legal. Again, the floor, the concrete's lava, and the ramp is the safe zone. It's the nice puffy cloud, apparently. Uh, Simmons goes for a three-point stance, but Taylor dodges, and Simmons tumbles to the ramp, and so then the Taylor-made man gets the advantage, but it's not for very long, though, as Simmons makes his comeback with a big two-handed choke hold. Taylor's just bumping his ass off for Simmons for the bulk of this match. It's impressive how well he makes Simmons look in, in this whole thing. Terry almost slips on the leapfrog because Simmons gets up kind of early, He's able to recover before hitting the ropes, though, so kudos to Taylor. But then he eats a snap power slam, and Ron wins. Do not step to Ron. I'm going to give this one two stars out of four. I think it was a very well-executed matchup. Taylor's clearly a stepping stone to Simmons on his way to the World Championship, which I'll get into in a second. But both guys got their strengths over very well, their characters over very well. So I really have you know no complaints to the matchup in general. I think it was a nice middle-of-the-road two-star out of four matchup. After the match, Simmons has an interview at ringside with Jim Ross, and he has some very powerful motivational words saying, no matter who you are or where you are in life, you can become the best if you work hard just like Ron Simmons. And of course, within two months of this, he would become the best, officially, because it was in August of the same year that he'd become the WCW champion after beating Vader. He was the first officially recognized Black World Heavyweight Champion with his wins, so this is just right before Simmons really hits that upper echelon. Our next match pits old versus young as Greg the Hammer Valentine takes on Marcus Alexander Bagwell. Look at the young baby face of Marcus Bagwell here. He's fresh 
off his rookie year, so he's just about one year in the business officially, years before he'd become part of the American Males, or become Buff the Stuff in the NWO, or then star in Skinamax movies, or become a gigolo. This is very young in his career. Bagwell is hot to start things off. He's got an answer for everything Greg is doing early on. Valentine does get a leg up briefly, tries a second rope elbow drop, but Bagwell moves. Greg does get out of the way of a knee drop, though, and starts to work on Buff's knee pretty aggressively. Bagwell showing a lot of heart, even gets Greg pinned a couple of times with like a schoolboy and a backslide, but is still noticeably limping here. In the end, Greg hits a shin breaker that does not look very good. He locks in the figure four and Marcus taps. Greg the Hammer Valentine wins this one. I'm going to give it one and a half stars out of four. It's a pretty basic match, but it's still fairly enjoyable. A good contrast. The story of the young gun versus the old grizzled vet I think plays very well here. Valentine really couldn't do all that much, but I think he was able to carry, Mar carry Marcus to a competent match. I would have liked to have seen more flash from Bagwell. I mean, he was pretty quick in the ring and, and tried to get Greg off his feet a few times. He showed heart, but he didn't really wow me with offense. Like, nothing looked bad except for that shin breaker near the end. Uh, I'm not really sure whose fault that was, but yeah, I would like to see more kind of exciting stuff from Bagwell in this match. This next match is a false count anywhere on the Gulf Coast match, so a lot of leeway here, as the WCW champion Sting takes on Cactus Jack. He's as strange as a man can be. He ain't got no family. The reason behind this match is Sting has got Vader uh, in his sights in the future for Great American Bash in a championship matchup here, but Harley Race has hired the hitman Cactus Jack to kind of wear down Sting and beat him up and soften him up for Big Van Vader in July. Uh, Jack begins the match on the ramp. When that happened, I was I got flashbacks to King of the Ring 98 when Mankind started the Hell in a Cell match on the roof. You know, Cactus Jack knows it's false count anywhere, so he starts on the ramp waiting for Sting, who comes out, he answers the challenge, they lock eyes, he takes the robe off for the belt, and they run at each other. Great opening part to this matchup here. Of course, Jack takes a big back body drop on the ramp about a minute into the match. Good use of the ropes, like hitting them like he was in the ring. A big face buster. This is on the first minute of the match. Big backdrop, a face buster on the ramp. Sting crashes and burns on the turnbuckle post, and Jack hits the apron elbow drop. It's the first of what will be many, many bumps on the concrete between both of these guys, more so fully in this matchup. The elbow drop off the apron is always hard to watch, especially now that there's no padding to protect either guy. Jack hits a sunset flip off the apron onto the floor, and then Sting just gently rolls his way down onto the concrete. Like, Jack took all that bump, did not need to take that bump. He took it all on his ass and his hips, and then like his ankles hit the railing, and then Sting just gingerly rolls down the back. I'm like, Sting took none of that bump. Jack took the whole thing, and it was ultimately pointless. They fight into the crowd, a big suplex onto the concrete. So far, McFoley's taking like four or five huge bumps on the bare concrete. There's fighting in the ring, fighting out of the ring. Cactus brings a chair into the conversation and starts walloping the champion with it. But Sting comes back and hits Jack with a belly-to-back suplex on the concrete. Again, each one of these concrete bumps just makes me absolutely wince. Knowing there's no padding, no mats anywhere, uh, it, just, it just looks so painful. Sting, to his credit, does take some big bumps in this one. Not nearly as many as Jack, though. There's one point where Sting gets cut off by going like ribs first onto the barricade. That was kind of his gimmick, kind of his special cutoff was like running into the barricade a lot. Jack to the second rope, Sting on the outside, goes for the elbow, but Sting dodges it. Uh, Sting hits back with the chair, fighting on the ramp, a double arm DDT on the Sting who kicks out. A big running clothesline by Sting who then gets the top rope and jumps off with another diving clothesline on a cactus, hits him on the ramp. But again, because this is false cut anywhere, no disqualification, Sting can do that in this case. Sting covers and he wins the match. I'm going to give this one three and a half stars. Just a wild and wooly, insane match. Fast paced, lots of crazy bumps. Again, more so on the side of Foley. He makes Sting look amazing in this matchup. He, like, Jack looks very intense. McFoley looks like a killer, but Sting has the fire and heart of a true, pure, white meat babyface champion, and he he's, he's valiant here in his, his, his victory against Cactus Jack. This was crazy. I love this match. It was very entertaining, uh, and it was also the right amount of time, too. It was only about ten minutes long. Long. Anything longer, I think it would have got a little ridiculous, but here I think it was the perfect, just encapsulated time period for this matchup here. Sting would go on, however, to lose the championship to Vader the next month at the Great American Bash.
The next match is a 30-minute Iron Man challenge as the U.S. champion Rick Rude takes on Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. This is a non-title matchup. Now, the second match in a row here on the show where one of the major singles championships is not being defended, which is pretty disappointing, especially for this particular title because Steamboat is already the number one contender for the U.S. title according to what they say on commentary. So why this wouldn't be a championship match, I'm not entirely sure just from a kayfabe perspective. Anyway, Steamboat returned to WCW in late 1991 as the surprise tag team partner for Dustin Rhodes. And then Rude and the Dangerous Alliance started making salacious comments and rumors about Steamboat being unfaithful to his family. Uh, Polly Dangerously and Medusa, by the way, are barred from ringside for this matchup. And Medusa, it makes sense because, you know, she's still in the bikini contest, so she's got to be mentally prepared for that, of course. And uh, then meanwhile, Steamboat comes out with his wife, Bonnie, and their son, Ricky Jr., the first family of WCW they're billed as here. Steamboat goes for the ribs right away with a big gut buster in the first, like, 10 seconds of this matchup here. And Ventura, oh, that wacky Jesse Ventura with one of his conspiracy theories. He says that Steamboat left Ricky Jr. in the ring so Rude couldn't attack him right away and then gave, gave Ricky the chance to get the jump on Rick Rude in the first seconds of the matchup here. And, you know, damn, what if he was right? It was something I was thinking as he was going on about it in commentary. I mean, man, what if Ventura's right here? What if we're in some weird alternate dimension all of a sudden where Steamboat is a devious heel? The first part of the match is just all Steamboat here. And Jesse describes Steamboat on commentary as sadistic, like Dr. No and Goldfinger. I'm like, is that really the best, most timely reference you can make for this moment right here, Jesse? Anyway, big surprise move by Rude, who puts a knee up and hits Steamboat right in the mush and gets the first pinfall after eight minutes straight of him getting his ass kicked. So it kind of came from out of nowhere. I mean, the knee looked stiff as hell, but still kind of a shocker that that was the first pinfall after Steamboat had had such dominance in those first eight minutes. Then Rude hits the Rude Awakening right afterward and is now all, all of a sudden up to nothing in the span of one minute. Rude goes to the top rope, hits a big knee drop on a steamboat, so Steamboat actually gets the point on the basis of a disqualification because Rude jumped from the top rope, and that's a no-no now. But then right afterward, he pins Steamboat and gets another pinfall, so it's three to one Rude. If the internet were a thing around this time, fans all over would be reeling, four falls in, for, in ten minutes, oh, this sucks, I hate WCW now. Speaking of fans, uh, the one thing I liked about this match almost more than anything is that you didn't have fans counting down at the end of every minute going three, two, one, and the whole time. Rude hits a big pile driver, but Steamboat kicks out. Rude goes for a tombstone, but then Steamboat reverses it and hits one of his own. Steamboat gets a point. It's now 3-2 advantage still Rude. Both guys look to be absolutely spent by the 20-minute mark, but Steamboat pulls a backslide out of nowhere to tie up the match. It's three falls apiece. And so now the whole thing is, who's going to break the tie, Rude or Steamboat? Steamboat with a fighting spirit here. He hits Rude with a Rude Awakening at one point, but there is a rope break. Rude's got a sleeper on Steamboat, but Ricky keeps fighting and fighting. He's in that hold for ages as we get down to the final minute. Ricky's able to recover, pushes himself off the turnbuckle and lands onto Rude. Piper and Hart style gets the go-ahead pinfall and is now 4-3. to three. And from here, Rude spends the last 30 seconds of spamming the hell out of Steamboat with running attack after running attack. Shoulder tackles, clotheslines, he's trying to pin him over and over again. Cannot get the three count and the time expires and Ricky wins the match here. But not the championship, but still a great victory for him. Four stars out of four. A fantastic match and a great story told here. Great resolve shown by Steamboat as he fights his way back from a deficit and pulls out a come-from-behind win within the last minute. It was great stuff here. Uh, crazy enough, this was pretty much the last time. The, this is the end of the feud, essentially. Steamboat would not get another shot at the U.S. title with Rude as the champion. That was made clear later in the show. You had a, a, an interview on the stage between Eric Bischoff and uh, Ricky Steamboat. Polly Dangerously would show up and say, as long as Rude's the champion, you're never getting another shot at the title, which is kind of fucked up because he won he beat Rude fair and square in this Iron Man challenge. He's a number one contender anyway, so why? Anyway, Cactus Jack then pulls Steamboat off the stage, and they fight their way to the back, so that's the beginning of that new little rivalry there. But yeah, that's pretty much the end of Rude and Steamboat as a feud. Uh, Ricky would become the new TV champion a couple of months later after beating stunning Steve Austin, so that was kind of his little consolation prize. Well, after that awesome wrestling match, it's time for a big old palate cleanser. It's round two of the bikini contest between Medusa and Missy Hyatt, the bathing suit portion of the series. Medusa comes out first, which is smart. Get the heel out first to get the booze. And when she comes out with the jacket and the hat, she kind of reminds me of Tony Storm a little bit there. Missy Hyatt comes out in a bikini, which confused me because I thought it was the bikini was for the third round. You know, we'll see what happens in the third round, but at least they put the order correct this time with Medusa and Missy. 
Fun fact, Polly Dangerously is the only person to have worked both Beach Blast 1992 and this Sunday's SummerSlam 2018. Thought you might want to know that. He's here managing the Dangerous Alliance in six-man tag team action. It's Arn Anderson, Bobby Eaton, and TV champion Stunning Steve Austin versus Nikita Koloff, Dustin Rhodes, and Barry Windham. And the referee for this matchup is the senior official, Ole Anderson, the kayfabe brother of Arn. Holy crap, look at this matchup here. Look at everyone involved in this ring and tell me this is not one of the greatest collections of talent in one match you'll ever see. Just all these past and future world champions, uh, creative minds, ring generals. This is just like this right here. You could have all these guys involve the matchup here at a convention and the convention would sell out. Like, it'd be amazing. I guess at some point between 91 and 92, Nikita Koloff became a babyface again because I know that in Great American Bash 91, the previous year in the dog collar match against Sting, he was a big old heel in that match. He's a house of fire early in this matchup and the heels scamper away and power out trying to find a new strategy against him. It's plan number two, according to Paul E. Dustin Rose takes a lot of punishment in this matchup here. He's the one taking all the heat, and the alliance works well against him. At one point in the match, they pull up a lower third, because during the whole bikini contest thing, they said, call the 900 number and vote who you think should win. And they pull up this lower third graphic that shows that Medusa has a two-point advantage on Missy Hyatt, 51 to 49. And to me, that sounded like a bunch of bullshit, unless it was a bunch of smart marks, or whatever the equivalent was in 1992, calling the hotline and voting for Medusa because, you know, yay heels or something. Boo Missy, she's not a real wrestling lady, whatever. <laughs> Austin hits the stun gun on Rhodes, who's getting beat to hell, but he's so tall, he can fall back far enough and just reach out and tag Barry Windham into the match. Windham pins Austin after the superplex, but Anderson breaks up the pinfall by diving off the top rope onto Barry, which is a no-no, and Ole Anderson, the referee, catches him and calls for disqualification. I'm going to give this one one and a half stars out of four. I know it sounds outrageous considering who's in this ring, but it was just an okay match. Everything looked okay. Nothing was botched or screwed up, but the match itself was just lackluster. It's hard to make everyone in this match look good when it's a six-man tag team match. Add the DQ finish, and it's kind of forgettable. But since this is kind of the first big unveiling of these new rules, I guess you have to have at least one match on this show with that kind of finish to establish what the rules are and that top rope moves are banned. So I guess there's that going for it. It's now time for what you've all been waiting for, folks. It's round three of the Bikini Contest. It's the itsy bitsy teeny weeny dot 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 bikini portion of the show here and now Jesse Ventura all night's been saying how he should have been the MC for that contest so he can't stands no more he gets on stage and joins Johnny B. Bad Sheriff Johnny B. Bad I might say uh, on stage to MC the rest of this thing uh -huh. ha, 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 ha. Uh -huh. Medusa comes out first, clearly does not want to be there. Like I said, the body language is just so apparent. Uh, Missy Hyatt doesn't want to come out because it says someone stole her bikini, which somehow fits in this little letter envelope she pulls out here. Um, she steals Jesse's scarf and headband, and within like 20 seconds is able to somehow fashion a functional bikini out of the fabric within seconds. And like, it's it's like, it's supposed to be the big reveal. Oh my God, look how it's, and like, it's, I think that the blue bikini from the previous round was more revealing than what you saw this one. It was just kind of like Missy Hyatt apparently is a master seamstress. She's the Scarlett O'Hara of our time. She can fashion a bikini out of a do-rag and a scarf that Jesse Ventura is wearing. Medusa gets pissed off because Bad saying, oh, well, Missy Hyatt clearly wins. Medusa gets pissed. Why is she, Why should she care? It's like, it's like, from what we've seen from her body language and her demeanor, she doesn't want to be there. So why does she care if she loses? She corners Bad and then they fall into the tent together. And then all of a sudden you see Bad like walks out having stolen her top. Then Jesse's like, I got to go run in and check on her like, Ugh. <laughs> like this is just a weird weird segment overall i guess i had to fill the time somehow our main event is for the Tag Team Championships as the Steiner brothers, Rick and Scott, defend against the team of Terry Gordy and Dr. Death, Steve Williams. This is a much ballyhooed main event for the night, pitting uh, two teams that many people believed were the two best tag teams in the industry at that time. The company, give credit to WCW because they give a ton of credibility and legitimacy to Gordy and Williams, who were pretty much making their like first impression for WCW here on this show. But they had been teaming in Japan, and all Japan Pro Wrestling to be specific, uh, from 1990 up until this point, and they would remain a team in Japan until 1993. Interesting point that their official team name in All Japan was the Miracle Violence Connection, and I'm so disappointed they didn't get to use that name in WCW. Big disappointment there. But yeah, they were a big team, big deal in Japan for three years. They won a lot of tag team gold, so this is one of their biggest matches here against the Steiners. They never wrestled before, so kind of a dream matchup here in that context. A very big feeling out process between both teams, between all four guys. 
guys. For a very long time, we don't get a part in the match where like one team gets all the heat and the other one's selling and then there's a hot tag and all stuff. It's pretty much very evenly matched for the first half of this whole thing, which I think does a great service to both teams and gets everyone uh, getting over in a big way. Gordy and Williams finally get their heat when the ref's back is turned and they work over Scott's knee after a cheap shot. Williams has Scott in a Boston Crab, but he's able to reach out and tag Rick in while he's in the hole to Rick's the house of fire. Gordy and Williams get back into it. They're on top again after a second rope power slam by Terry Gordy, but Rick keeps kicking out of it. Rick now has a lot of the heat as Scott sells on the apron. Rick and Williams are just beating the hell out of each other here. Dr. Death with the Oklahoma Stampede attempt, but Rick gets free and hits the Steiner line, then another one to Terry Gordy. So after almost a half hour of wrestling, the Steiners were finally showing some fire and looking to be on top here. With less than a minute to go, Scott gets tagged in and starts throwing fools around. Scott has terrible clock management though because he starts playing with the crowd as the ring announcer is counting down from 10 seconds. Scott hits the Frankensteiner just as the match comes to a time limit draw. Bell rings, no clear winner. Hell of a match though after 30 straight minutes of wrestling. I'm going to give this one three stars out of four. What a hard hitting physical bout between these two teams. The fact that it was a time limit draw and it was the main event kind of a double whammy of disappointment but I mean despite that it was still one of the better matches of the night despite the finish kudos to WCW for giving this tag team match the main event spot although I do wonder why the match featuring Sting who is like the world champion was so far down the card as it was but that's not taking anything away from the tag team main event awesome match but as good as this match was none of the men involved would be around with the company by January 1993 the Steiner brothers they would leave leave the company in November of 92 after a pay dispute when trying to re-up and renew their contracts with the company. So they left. They worked in WWF from like late 92 to about 1994. They had a cup of coffee in ECW and then went back to WCW in 1996 as a tag team before eventually breaking up in 1998. The Miracle Violence Connection, they would win the tag team titles from the Steiner Brothers in a rematch from here the week before Great American Bash in July. And they would also go on to win the vacant NWA World Tag Team team championships in a tournament right after that as they'd hold on to both belts until September. And then Gordy would leave the company by October. Williams would leave after Starcade in December. So yeah, this great match was the main event of this inaugural Beach Blast pay-per-view and no one from that match was around by this time 93. My final grade for WCW Beach Blast 1992 is an A- grade. Except for the bikini contest stuff, which I thought was more silly and goofy than anything else, it was an all-around great show. Even the matches that I thought were like the worst of the bunch weren't bad matches at all. They were still like competent, well-executed matches, but just, you know, didn't really get to that next step and didn't really do anything for me. But everything else was pretty solid. Like, like I said, the uh, Pillman versus Flamingo match, great opener. Sting and Cactus Jack, a great brawl. Rude versus Steamboat, fantastic wrestling uh, story told there. And the Steiners versus uh, the Miracle Violence Connection was very physical and very intense. And I thought just overall, those four, uh, those four tenants, those four pillars of the show really put it over the edge for me. And the, the rest of the wrestling wasn't bad at all. You know, like I said, 1992, this whole period was probably one of the best eras for WCW in terms of in-ring work. The new rules, the top rope stuff was a little silly, but most of the folks involved made it work, and I really enjoyed this show. Well, that's my review of Beach Blast 92. Thank you for watching, and thanks again to Ricky and Jordan on Patreon for nominating this show for me to review. If you want to play a role in determining which classic shows I look at in the future, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have the chance to nominate shows for me to review right here in the future. Next time on the Classic Review, we're going back to the WWF, we're going back to SummerSlam, you know what? The last two reviews have had some heavy involvement from Jesse the Body Ventura. So let's pull off the hat trick, folks. Let's go to SummerSlam 1999. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.